Okay, welcome to class uh, 23. And this is just going to be a, a quick uh, wrap up class uh, before I get into uh, our wrap up discussion here. The one thing I want to mention is look uh, at the time for your section for the final exam. Uh, make sure to look at that. Uh, there's a, a letter that's been posted to the course page that describes when the exam is. Uh, and there's also a study guide that's been posted, so you should take a, definitely take a look at that. The study guide is in the form of an outline, and on that outline, uh, hierarchically listed are the topics that you should probably uh, take a look at. So make sure to do that. Oh, God. All right, out. So make sure to do that. Now let's go and do our quick wrap-up, and this, this won't take long, so just... Uh, take a few minutes to, to look through this. Now, as we saw uh, previously, all the way back to in, um, I don't know, lecture one or lecture two, whatever, we talked about motivations for concurrent uh, programming or concurrent systems. And those three main reasons are organization. In other words, the problem itself uh, can be naturally solved with a concurrent solution. Games would be a good example of that when you want to uh, you have different entities that are all kind of separate from each other. Maybe you have a thread govern each, or even just the overview, you have a thread that deals with rendering, a thread that deals with the network communication for a multiplayer game, maybe a, a thread that deals with the uh, game logic, a thread that deals with uh, the AI entities, whatever. Um, but organization is a big one. Uh, also, you might think of like an industrial system. You might have a thread that takes user input, uh, from some control panel, a thread that then reads the sensors at a certain update rate. Uh, maybe you have a different thread that uh, uh, monitors some sort of uh, safety interlocks and does something about them. But the idea is that organization can be a big one. Another uh, important usage of concurrent programming would be speed up. So if you think about distributed computing, uh, think about a large system like like Google uh, with their search or think about a large system like YouTube where at any given time there are probably, uh, I don't know, tens or hundreds of thousands of people watching videos at the same time. You could never implement something like that with a single uh, computer system at running a single program. You need to have some sort of distributed model uh, with multiple processors running in some sort of cluster. And so speed up can be an important thing. But even if you're on a single machine, uh, think of a game again, uh, it helps to be able to take advantage of multiple cores there, to have one core doing uh, game logic, uh, other cores dealing with the networking, uh, and so forth. And it also allows for better resource utilization on your machine uh, in an operating system, even if, even if you have a single processor. So in other words, rather than have a, having a process have to wait for something, you can switch to a different process while that one's waiting, and when that one, uh, become, whenever whatever resource it's waiting for becomes available, you jump back to that. And so that's that kind of multitasking operating system uh, paradigm. And the last one, it's unavoidable. If you think of a network system where two systems have to communicate, you're naturally going to have concurrency. If you have some sort of uh, multi-processing architecture, uh, the cat is bothering the dog now, uh, the, you're going to naturally have concurrency there. Anytime you have uh, a system that has more than one processor and they need to interact with each other in some way, you're going to have concurrency. And in my experience, and uh, I think this is important for you to, to hear, in my experience, Every commercial project I've ever worked on has had uh, concurrency concerns or uh, needs to control concurrency in some way, every one of them. And so let's start with a few, so embedded systems. So I design uh, and uh, build and kind of innovate embedded systems design and write embedded firmware for that. And on those embedded systems, like there's a whole pile of them sitting around here, uh, in various forms, uh, one or another of these, then these little systems like this, 
Uh, a lot of them have a single processor, but I've designed systems that have used uh, more than one processor. So, uh, for example, I have designed a motor control uh, for a motor controller project for a musical instrument systems that have like eight uh, or nine processors on them and they all have to communicate with each other. And then for the virtual reality systems uh, that I've been uh, a part of designing uh, and writing the code for, those in some cases have upwards of 23, 25 processors that all have to communicate and all have to work together to solve some sort of a problem. And so on those things, uh, and even with a single processor solutions, you still have concurrency concerns. And the reasons being that you have some sort of hardware interrupt. In other words, uh, think about the way USB works. The way USB works is the host fires an interrupt that says, hey, I'm going to talk to you, uh, chip, processor. And the processor has no control over when that happens. It just happens. Another example might be a wireless packet coming into that that needs to be processed and downloaded. The processor has no control over that, or a timer ticking. The timer could tick at any time, and maybe you have to take an action based on that timer. And so anywhere you have some sort of hardware interrupts like that, that are being uh, caused by some external source, be it some other piece of hardware, some communication interface, uh, or some peripheral like a timer ticking, uh, anywhere you have a hardware interrupt like that, if you have some sort of shared variable, then suddenly you have to be careful uh, when you're accessing that because you have, to have two different uh, threads or the main program and then the interrupt happens and it accesses that shared variable and imagine that shared variable is only partly updated or that shared variable uh, is being in the process of being updated when the interrupt tr also tries to update it. And so one of the things that uh, I would uh, hope you would do there is understand the use of the volatile keyword because that can be another uh, source of problems that where the optimizer decides to use a register uh, for a shared variable because it makes the code faster. But if that shared variable is looked at by some other uh, uh, interrupt handler or something somewhere, then you're not going to see it updated because the, pro the compiler decided to use a register for optimization purposes. So know and understand how to use the volatile keyword. Know and understand if you have some kind of shared variable that's shared between both an interrupt handler and other code that runs or two interrupt handlers. Know that you might need to add something like a lock to lock that, update it, unlock it. And also notice that that could be true even if you just have one thing changing a value and another thing reading the value. That if you're on, for example, a uh, an architecture that is an eight or a 16 bit architecture and you go to, let's say update a 32 bit integer, that has to happen in multiple steps. It has to happen like update the least significant byte, update the next one, the next one, the next one. So if it's an eight bit architecture and you have uh, a four byte integer, you have to update that in four uh, different steps, one for each byte of that. And note that if the interrupt fires and tries to read that value, you might have half of it from one update and half of it from an old update, and that could give you a completely wrong value. Uh, other things in embedded systems that are uh, where concurrency comes in is interfacing with hardware components where they're doing their own thing and then you need to go to read them. And they can't control when you're going to read them. You can't control what they're doing in some cases. Uh, also communicating with other systems. You have two processors. They communicate with each other. You have two different... Uh, programs in two different places that were running, so you have naturally their uh, concurrency. Sometimes you might have uh, one system design that has many processors. Like I said, uh, the VR suit has uh, over 20 processors that all have to work together on that, and that's not even including the host machine that's talking to the uh, system that has multiple processors. And then you have multiple tasks uh, that have to communicate and cooperate. Uh, and you might have a need to respond to asynchronous events, like a user input uh, key press, or if it's an embedded system, a machine safety interlock uh, reporting its message. Or if it's a vehicle system, the airbag sensor saying the airbag sensor uh, says this needs to be deployed. Um, and a lot of times those embedded systems are well suited to concurrent uh, system designs, uh, concurrent solutions, 
and a lot of times it's just unavoidable that you you have to have interrupts you have to have more than one processor you have to talk to this hardware that's doing its own thing concurrently and so it helps if you're doing that so for you CET students who are doing some sort of embedded system design writing firmware for an embedded system hardware interrupts uh, are going to be part of that design probably communicating with other systems is going to be part of that design uh, interfacing with hardware components is clearly going to be part of that so this is good stuff to know and remember now web systems or apps uh, desktop apps or web-based systems a web-based system might have multiple concurrent users they might have to share some database uh, data set that's stored in a database or sure share a data set that's stored in uh, memory in some way and we have to preserve the integrity of that data you can't have one uh, just like we looked at with the ATM problem you can't have in a network based system like that you can't have it so that this part of the code is accruing interest while this person is making withdrawal and the withdrawal gets lost we can't have that we have to preserve that data integrity which means that that's important and that's not just true for systems like that it could be true for any kind of web-based system with multiple concurrent users uh, and even a desktop application that only has a single user can benefit from concurrent uh, design. We have multiple threads to handle different uh, aspects of the app design. You might have a task for the GUI, one for uh, communication, one for application logic, maybe something that reads the files and writes the files, maybe a task that does backups periodically, whatever. Um, and you can also, for app desktop app development, get better performance by utilizing more than one core. So you could have multiple cores and say, well, I'll put, make this one do the calculations while this one handles the GUI uh, interface. Client server based systems, uh, where you have multiple concurrent users, you have shared data moving to uh, users from the system or from uh, the system to those users. Uh, application servers, web servers, uh, game servers, shared files, um, and so forth. But the idea there is anytime you have a network-based system, you have concurrency. It's unavoidable. And anytime you have multiple concurrent users that are logging into a system and interacting with it, the concurrency gets uh, worse, especially if they're sharing some sort of database uh, that they are also interacting with by posting updates to it. And Again, uh, I have uh, com had commercial projects that have done all of these things. Also, hardware design, that's sort of what we talked about with embedded systems. Um, but this could be a hardware design that doesn't even involve a processor. You could have concurrent things going on. Um, or the design of the processor itself. Uh, this transistor uh, logic path is doing something at the same time this is doing. And that's true for modern processors and modern systems where it's a pipeline architecture, where you're fetching one instruction while you're uh, uh, decoding the previous one while you're executing the one that was two ago. So overlapping those things to keep the uh, flow of data moving can certainly be uh, something that you should build into a design to make it perform uh, optimally. And but, but when you do that, you can end up with race conditions where two things are happening at the same time and what if the wrong one finishes uh, first so you have to build in hardware interlocks for things uh, where the race condition could create a problem and also notice that with hardware design maybe you have a distributed computing model uh, to achieve better performance uh, clearly something like YouTube or Google search uh, or even something a little more simple like uh, reddit where there's multiple users interacting and sending messages or Facebook or uh, Discord, you have multiple users there. And that might not be a hardware design as much as an architectural uh, design, but concurrency plays a big role in that. And then finally, uh, I gave game programming its own separate kind of subsection here, um, just because there's uh, some of the gaming students in this class. And notice with a game, you want to have things uh, organized as separate tasks. Maybe you have a task that's dealing with rendering, one that's dealing with uh, the sound and music, uh, playing those back, changing the sounds, fading things in, fading things out. Uh, also user input, AI, non-player character entities might have their own threads. 
uh, their own processes, game logic tasks. Uh, network, uh, IO, file IO, and there's a couple things that are missing here. Uh, I would put GPU programming on this as well because GPUs are essentially these massively parallel uh, system architectures. I wish we'd had a, another couple weeks in this class so we could have played with that uh, some, but with a massively parallel uh, vector computer, which is essentially what a GPU is, you can use GPUs not just to do graphics related things, but you can use GPUs to do uh, general purpose computational tasks. Uh, and so you see a lot of things like GPU programming being used to do simulated smoke or fluid flow or uh, fire propagation or uh, even game logic tasks with, uh, like you have that, uh, I forget what it's called, but that totally accurate battle simulator or whatever it's called. Uh, things like that where you just have tens of thousands of characters that all need to do something. That's a good place for a parallel architecture like a GPU to come into play. Uh, and GPUs by their nature are parallel processing machines, which means concurrency could be a concern there. Now, to kind of finish up here, uh, I'm going to repeat this again. That every commercial project I've worked on has had concurrency concerns. And here, every single one of them has had concurrency in it. So I want you to make sure to uh, be cognizant of that. This isn't just a class that we do because it's required. This isn't a class. It's just uh, some esoteric thing that we've covered. I've tried to relate it to uh, problems. I, we started out the lecture with examples where bad programmers or uh, programmers who weren't careful about concurrency created massive problems that included killing people or losing tons of money uh, for their companies or both. So as a reminder, uh, why is it such an important thing to know about and be proactive about? Well, we looked at the number of orderings. So if you imagine just two concurrent tasks with 150 instructions in each task, and those are relatively small programs. Um, I think I've written more than 150 lines of code uh, for a program yesterday uh, evening. And so that's the kind of thing with just two of those running concurrently, you wind up with this huge number that's over 100,000 times more than the number of atoms in the universe. That's the number of effective orderings uh, that are possible. And if just a few of those are could create a problem, then the that could come up when you're running the program. So the important thing about concurrency is to note is it's difficult uh, to test. We can't predict which ordering we'll get because concurrency by its nature is non-deterministic uh, if it's left uncontrolled. And if just one ordering is bad, uh, bad meaning it violates either a safety property or a liveness property, then that could happen and it's very difficult to test for. Imagine a one in that chance of that coming up or maybe even a, uh, there's a hundred thousand in that chance of coming up. It's still going to be very unlikely. But once you have your program being used by, I don't know, a billion users, then it, and they're using it every day constantly, then suddenly you can have this thing in the, uh, that causes a catastrophic failure. All right, and it, so it's dangerous to play the odds. Testing with concurrency can be difficult because it's all non-deterministic. And the benefits, though, uh, there clearly are benefits to concurrency. Sometimes it's unavoidable. But remember that you need to be aware of the dangers and know how to recognize them and, and issue or and eliminate those. And you need to do that before they happen. In other words, rather than writing the code in like a normal single threaded program, you run it, you test it, you test it with a variety of inputs and you're like, hey, it seemed to work. That's great. Let's put it out there. But with a concurrent solution, you need to be more proactive than just throwing together some garbage code and then testing it and refining it. You need to think, OK, I have two threads. What is the what things are they could they both be accessing at the same time? What is the interface between those uh, different tasks or processes or CPUs uh, and their code? What does the interface between them look like? And that's important to think through when you're designing the system. As soon as you have concurrency, there's some things you have to think through. And in our case, uh, we looked at ways. Uh, types of problems, and then we looked at, uh, so we looked at threads, processes, asynchronous programming, uh, a little bit with distributed computing, and then we learned about mechanisms to control uh, 
that or help us with concurrent execution. Uh, and we looked at things like locks and semaphores and bounded semaphores and barriers and events um, and shared memory access and uh, uh, queues and all kinds of other things. So we looked at a lot of different control mechanisms uh, and looked at the situations where they might be uh, best used. And the whole point of those uh, mechanisms, though, was to ensure either safety property or liveness property. For, so, again, for a system to be considered correct, we have to ensure both safety and liveness. We, those are t the two aspects of correctness. In other words, safety, it has to produce the right answer, and liveness is it has to produce, eventually produce some result. Um, so if it locks up, it's not correct. If it finishes, but it gives you garbage data that's been corrupted, it's not correct. We have to have both of those aspects to have correctness. And hopefully, uh, the stuff that you learned in this class, uh, well, hopefully you did learn something in this class, and hopefully the things that you learned will make you a better programmer, engineer, designer, developer, whatever. Uh, maybe it'll make you a better person, too. I don't know. Um, but knowledge is power. Uh, again, uh, I always thought think of programming as like being able to, or engineering, designing things as being able to do magic, that I can create something like this. I can put my parts of my brain into these chips, and then they do things outside of my head. It's very magical. And the more you learn, the more magical stuff that you can do. Uh, so it's kind of like a wizard. The more spells you learn, the more powerful you become. And hopefully with concurrency, it helps you use those powers for good and not accidentally uh, blow things up or kill people or crash planes or whatever. Uh, so I hope the systems uh, you design incorporate, uh, especially, well, if they're concurrent in nature, incorporate some of what you learned here. And I also hope that if mysterious bugs arise in a system you're working on, there's something that somebody else has started, uh, and that those bugs seem non-deterministic, meaning they're kind of sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, and uh, sometimes they're errors, sometimes they're not, sometimes it locks up, sometimes it doesn't, then that should be a good indication for you to look at any parts of that system that might be concurrent and how the, those concurrent parts interact with each other. And then hopefully you remember what you learned in this class with fixing those. So sometimes uh, you'll get pulled into a project that has concurrency bugs already in it, uh, and you might have to tease those out and figure out how to fix those. And uh, that's it, uh, I was going to say, for today. Uh, but really, that's all forever, at least for this semester. I'll probably see uh, a good number of you uh, next year in classes, uh, maybe automata, maybe something else. Um, but finish your labs. Uh, make sure to get those submitted uh, before the end of the last class of the semester. And then I want you to study for that final. Again, look at the... Uh, study guide that's been posted and if you have any question whatsoever uh, feel free to send me an email feel free to send me a text message uh, give me a call we'll set up a zoom we can talk through whatever it is you're working on but until then uh, stay safe and i look forward next fall uh, to seeing you guys in person rather than on these videos uh, but stay safe let me know if you have questions about things and be ready for the final exam, be sure to look at that letter uh, and know when the final exam is. And the final exam format will be very similar to the midterm. Uh, open notes, uh, open book if you have a book, um, but you can't use electronics except for the programming part. All right, that's it. Let me know if you have questions. Also, that dog is snoring like crazy. There's two dogs back there lying on my papers. One of them is snoring. All right. Anyway, bye.